Okay, let's start. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, myself. I'm Susanna Lau. I am uh, Vice Chair for IEEE Entrepreneurship in Region 9. As for those that are new and have not participated in a previous event for IEEE Entrepreneurship, I would like to mention that you can join IEEE Entrepreneurship Community if you are not a member. I uh, motivate you to do that. Uh, we are developing a series of events to promote startup creation, entrepreneurship among the, the members of IEEE with, with different programs. We have a mentorship program. We have a, a women's uh, support network for entrepreneurship. There are many other projects um, that also are available. You can go to our website, which is uh, entrepreneurship.ieee.org that I will put here. So I just, um, uh, motivate you to to click there and, and look at all those opportunities that IEEE Entrepreneurship is promoting right now. So today we are here because this is the second webinar of a series of four that we are organizing as a pilot program for the first time for Region 9. And our purpose is to promote entrepreneurship among the scientific, uh, the researchers community within IEEE and, and outside IEEE, of course, and it's to create this engineering driven uh, global innovation network that is one of the missions of IEEE entrepreneurship. So the last month uh, we shared uh, an event that was the first webinar. It was an introduction of the impact that uh, tech transfer has to do in in a in an ecosystem and how you can drive innovation and, and prosperity, which was also provided by Omar Sar, which is our speaker today. And today we are going to have the second one. So uh, there are going to be one per month until September. Uh, in September is also the first time we are going to do an on-site uh, tech transfer workshop and entrepreneurship workshop to both events are going to be from September 11 to 15 and all of you are welcome to apply for grants to participate and travel to Panama. Uh, We're going to select uh, a few participants uh, when I will, will provide uh, for those that are international uh, the, the materials that you will need to come to Panama like travel and meals and of course uh, the, the possibility of participating in, in this webinar. So. Uh, Omar, I would like to introduce him. He is uh, a technology enthusiast that joined Tandem Lounge by bringing amazing inventions to consumers. He is the director of technology and he is connecting with universities and researchers globally and guiding them to become founders uh, of ventures. So he is also chair of uh, IMATC Innovators Showcase and also he uh, research different topics regarding electronics and optical components. So with his experience and work in Tandem Lounge, he has helped researchers and scientists solve problems with cutting edge technology. He is today also part of the IEEE Entrepreneurship Steering Committee. And today he will be sharing with us uh, the second topic, which is the role of the university researchers and the technology transfer offices in deep technology innovation. So we will address topics such as how can researchers plan ahead their IP or intellectual property, how they can do licensing, how can they contribute or collaborate with industry, how can they do te technology transfer or how can they create their own company. So this is all to create startups, entrepreneurship and innovation. So with this introduction, uh, Omar, the presentation you, you have, the, it's yours. So welcome and thank you very much for, for sharing your experience in this second time with our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne, uh, for the kind introduction. So the, uh, the topics that, uh, hi everybody, uh, the topics that Susanna just listed, each of which could probably take their own uh, few hour webinars. So today is going to mainly be a rather shallow overview of the role that TTOs can play, uh, TTOs do play in this ecosystem in the hope to get you a little bit of insight into what these soldiers at the front line of technology transfer are doing. And if you're a researcher, uh, I thought I would also give you a glimpse into some of the mechanics behind how licensing works and the kinds of things to consider when you're thinking about uh, preparing your invention either for commercialization to larger industries or for startup generation. And then largely speaking, I also want to perhaps comment a little bit on uh, 
the interface that the TTOs end up playing and how to work with your local TTO in order to essentially get the best out of that relationship. Uh, and so here is hoping that this is the latest version of this deck. Yes. All right. So, uh, so TTOs. Um, first, let's let's define a little bit what we mean by a TTO. Uh, a technology transfer office, innovation office, partnerships and entrepreneurship office can come in many different names, but ultimately the role of this office is to serve as the interface uh, between an invention developed at a university and an interested licensing party or a partnership entity. Now, the hierarchy that you're going to see here is one that is perhaps the most common organizational hierarchy for where a TTO is located. You'll see it as the red box there. Typically, in most universities, it sits beneath the VP Research's office, which means that it sits in a sub hierarchy to the research goals of the university. Now, this is important to consider because it means that even though technology transfer offices are in the business of commercialization, they are still fundamentally bound to the ultimate mandates of the university. And I'll go into that in some detail in a moment. Now, in some cases, you might see a technology transfer office exist separately from a university. Uh, it might be a form of innovation uh, centralizing uh, institution. This, for example, happens here in Quebec, uh, where we have um, an institution called Excellus that acts as a central authority to at least five different universities, for the IP for five different universities. The structure in that case can create slightly different dynamics. Uh, but the goals of that technology transfer office remain the same. Now, the job of a technology transfer officer, uh, I see a lot of technology people becoming technology transfer officers uh, out of their PhDs. It is, it is a job that requires a high degree of depth in, in, in technology. It requires you to understand how research works. It requires you to be able to understand a very wide variety of research. And it also puts you in a situation where you're constantly touching base with the industry and the world around you, developing partnerships. So it's also a very social job. Um, and so often people are attracted to the technology transfer profession when they wish to apply what they've learned on the science, on the academic side, but towards the, the proliferation of technology rather than the broadening of human knowledge. Now, um, You'll notice that next to next to the technology transfer office in this hierarchy, you'll see things like research services. These are, for example, partnerships with uh, with organizations that, uh, for example, you might have a company like Samsung uh, collaborate with a university through a university industrial grant and provide funding into into a specific laboratory. Uh, note that research collaborations like this often occur in a different office or at least under different supervision than the technology transfer officers. Uh, but you can imagine that this interface is highly connected because intellectual property can be generated through that interface and then the technology transfer office would then get involved in licensing. And so uh, you, you'll see many different configurations, but largely speaking, the, the point to remember here is that the technology transfer office exists mainly to support the primary mandates of a university. And this becomes important later when we talk about the fundamental tension between commercialization uh, and, and, uh, and academic pursuit. So let's talk about that mandate. Um, now, this is something you'll probably see similar language in uh, a lot of universities, especially public universities. Uh, remember that universities, uh, you know, it's always good to figure out the motivations of an institution by following the money. And universities are often mostly funded by public money, so tax paying dollars, which means that they receive a very large set of motivations that are driven by the government. Uh, in addition to that, universities often receive one of their largest chunks of revenue from endowments. These are donations from alumni who've left the university. That means that the university then's motivations is going to be to encourage more public funding as well as more endowments, which means that, which ultimately in the context of a university often means servicing its students through education, servicing its researchers by helping them proliferate their research and as well as equipping them with, 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 with what they need in order to deliver that research and attracting high value researchers to the organization. And this sits above any kind of incentive to generate profit. Uh, and, and so ultimately, this, this is one of the fundamental tensions that exists um, that has created what we call the traction gap that we, that we described in the previous webinar. 
the reason why inventions are so difficult to get out there, one of the largest reasons is this cultural difference. The fact that the primary mandate of a university can sometimes on its surface come in direct conflict with the primary mandate of a company. So, so what you'll typically see uh, in, in, uh, in the written mandate of a university is that uh, and in the university technology transfer office is to facilitate the translation of academic research into practical applications, uh, often to the benefit of society on a local, national and global basis. To do so, and this is where you might see some commercial terms, but to do so at market rate in order to support research, education and teaching at the university by generating funding. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous webinar, um, the generation of revenue based on research is not something that universities have very successfully done worldwide, but it does remain one of the key performance indicators of the office. It's just uh, subjugated to uh, to things like translating academic research and proliferating it as well as attracting researchers. And then finally, to educate and serve as a resource for the academic community on matters relating to entrepreneurship, intellectual property and technology commercialization. So, um, so therefore, your technology transfer office, while while it does have a role in translating that in translating technology out there is largely going to be focused on supporting its researchers and this is a very important message um, oftentimes uh, the role of a technology transfer office can be misinterpreted by its inventors that they're off, that, that they're really the um, the part that researchers don't really have to worry about or will never really understand their role is in commercialization your role is in academic research there's no really no reason to talk to each other and who cares if you have an invention because uh, ultimately, it's not going to serve your work or it's, it's not going to really uh, impact your research. And, and the fact is that a technology transfer office exists far more than just to facilitate licensing. It exists to connect you into the outside world in such a way that whether or not you're interested in entrepreneurship, you can get massive augmentation of your research goals. So, um, oh, this is, uh, yes, this is in the wrong order, but uh, We'll uh, we'll touch on that later. So, so let's take a little let's take a little bit of dive into into what TTOs can offer for you if you wanted to build if you want to actually uh, work on commercializing your work. So let's say you have an invention in hand. What typically starts off is that you have uh, you have to file what's called a technology disclosure. Uh, that's just a fancy way of saying uh, a written version of your research described uh, in, uh, describing the invention that you proposed, its novelty. And this document then serves as the, as the basis for the start of your relationship with the technology transfer office. What this does then is, is enable the technology transfer office to engage its legal services in order to identify what kind of intellectual property you might need to file, uh, filing any patents that might be necessary, copyright and the like. Now, this is where you might see the first sticking point with researchers in that at this point, technology transfer offices have limited budgets. And so sometimes, uh, they need to be convinced of the value of your invention, and this can be a frustrating endeavor. Uh, so one of the things I highly recommend that researchers do before engaging the technology transfer office is, is, is learning about the role that their invention plays out in the world. Uh, and, and that essentially will allow, you to, will allow you to have a dialogue at the level of the TTO being able to justify why disclosing your invention will have value to both you and that office. And broadly speaking then, uh, a technology transfer office is someone you want to engage when you need legal support, uh, financial support, or strategic support. What this means is that if, for example, you're approached by a company uh, that wants to learn more about your work, you're worried about whether or not you can communicate confidentially about it. Uh, this is where your technology transfer office would come in. If you want to understand, if you need someone on your side, essentially, in order to engage these very large entities, this is where a technology transfer office will come in. And then um, often, uh, we in the academic area might develop a form of tunnel vision, looking for grants that are ultimately uh, based on pure research goals. But there is a plethora of grants out there that come from the industrial sector. Uh, these are grants that are often based on the strategic directives of various companies in many different fields. And uh, unless they email you directly or unless you're proactive in finding them, often uh, they might not show up on your radar. And, and the fact is that a good TTO will often build up a database of these kinds of grant opportunities. And so keeping in close contact with your TTO can also provide financial support for your research endeavors. Uh, and so I showed you this diagram in the last webinar. And what I was trying to say in the last diagram was that uh, ecosystems are essential to not just the development of startups, but ultimately to the economic development of entire countries, because 
uh, as we saw in the previous webinar, the vast majority of innovation uh, sits behind university gates. And so um, what I didn't point out at the time, which I'll point out now, is that ultimately the TTOs are the frontline workers uh, between the university part of the ecosystem and virtually every other part of that ecosystem. TTOs will be on the phone in your defense negotiating contracts with companies that want your research. Uh, they will support you in your endeavors in building a startup, uh, connecting you with invest, uh, investors, connecting you with customers. Uh, they will support you in, in your government engagements in terms of obtaining grants for basic research uh, and, uh, and, and so on. And so ultimately the strength of a TTO um, is that it is your port into the outside world when it comes to connecting your academic work, work with, with any interested parties. So, the vast majority of researchers will never engage their TTO. The vast majority of researchers are, are happy to, uh, to work within their labs. They've got more than enough cash uh, and, and they're plugging away, building, um, training students, training new researchers, um, and, and really never really giving commercialization a thought. I want to spend some time to explain why, even if you have zero interest in seeing uh, your work proliferate for commercial sake, there is an enormous amount of benefit you're leaving on the table for your own academic career if you don't at least try to engage uh, and see what kind of opportunities might sit there. The first is that research can't really sit in a vacuum. Basic science is meant to be proliferated for the benefit of this, for the outer world. And we do rely on publication houses to do this for us, publication houses like IEEE, um, but a technology transfer office can enable the proliferation and the, uh, of, of your work uh, to, through channels that are non-academic. Um, the, the state is actually very good at this. A few universities in the states are actually very good at this. Uh, we're bombarded with science news uh, on, from all sorts of channels on, on research occurring out of places like MIT, out of Stanford. And the reason for this is that they have an extremely engaged culture with their technology transfer offices because it's the TTO that can help you connect with those kinds of organizations uh, in order to promote your work. Um, financial benefits. Now, I did mention that uh, that there are massive financial benefits to the commercialization of your work. If you're if you're uh, if you happen to have your work picked up by large entities such as pharmaceutical companies, or for example, consumer technology companies. You can secure royalties, personal financial royalties that can go on for decades, ultimately, based on, on, on how relevant that work is to, to their products. And if you happen to go the startup route, uh, this, this is perhaps a little higher risk, but ultimately can, res can result in massive upside uh, personally uh, for you as a researcher. Um, we have quite a few researchers that have had their work commercialized through Tandem Launch and have received massive financial gains on the other side of those companies exiting. And then finally, and this part is generally understated, there is a dynamic here that tends to actually improve your standing as a professor or, or, your, or if you are hoping to become a professor, your ability to become uh, a tenured one. Um, because these days the government has, uh, many governments have started to prioritize not just the role of basic research, but how basic research ties to economic growth for the country. And so the filing of patents, the, uh, the filing of patents and the engagement with the outside world often uh, provides you with um, an advantage over other academics who have chosen not to engage in this way. It also, and this is a common problem for researchers who have either just started their, uh, their professorial pursuits or have wrapped up a, a large chapter of their research, it provides you with new and really interesting research problems to pursue. Uh, generally speaking, uh, when you commercialize your invention and it goes out into customer discovery, um, there, there's a part to play in, in, in discovering how your specific invention will form a, uh, form a product through which other people will benefit from it. But what usually happens is that, that that product will open up new markets and new needs or new frontiers to explore. And through maintaining the relationships you've made in that commercial effort, whether it's through startup building or direct licensing to large entities, that that dialogue, that continuing dialogue will feed research, really exciting research problems to you for the rest of your career. And so uh, there is almost this positive feedback loop that ends up forming. Um, disclosing your inventions, proliferating your inventions commercially 
leads to the engagement with the outside world, which leads to the generation of new markets and new needs, which generates new research problems for you to create new inventions for. Uh, and the cycle continues. So, I hope I've established that TTOs are important. And for those of you who are actually interested potentially in a career in technology transfer, um, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm part of Autumn uh, uh, as well as IEEE Entrepreneurship, but Autumn specifically is an organization that uh, connects technology transfer offices across the world. And so um, I, I, I can certainly help provide you with some more information on what it's like to become a technology transfer officer. If you're, an, if you're a researcher and, and you'd like to know a little bit more about how you can engage your technology transfer office or how to start thinking about your research, uh, this is what we'll dive into now. So, often the first question that people have is, how do I know if my invention is interesting? And uh, this is where it helps to, to take on a framework that's often used in deep technology product brainstorming. Uh, and that is highlighting the difference between technical problems and market problems. So, as a researcher, you're in the business of solving technical problems, research problems. These are challenges faced by researchers in a specific field, obviously. And the primary mandate, the primary motivation of you pursuing this, this field advancement is to advance knowledge. The product, if you will, of your research is going to be a paper that gets proliferated across the scientific community. It's going to get judged by academic peer review for scientific rigor. And your process stops when new knowledge is no longer an outcome. Uh, essentially, when the scientific value of what you're doing is, is no longer benefited by proceeding with the research. Market problems are deeply connected to technical problems. They're embodiments of technical problems, but they are the commercial implications, the customer needs that are created by the presence of that technical problem. They are satisfying a market problem means satisfying a customer need with a marketable product or a service. It's generally judged by market acceptance and commercial success. Now, not always commercial success if, for example, that product is free, uh, provided by free, free to the society, but by its use by that society. And ultimately, the process of solving a market problem doesn't stop until it's reliable and fully featured. And so, I'm going to tell the story. So last last week, last month, if you were with us, I, I told the story of our company Soundscript. I'm going to stick to that specific example just for consistency, but um, to highlight the, pro the the difference between a technical problem and how it ultimately starts to address a market problem and becomes a product. Uh, I'm going to tell the story of Soundscript. So Soundscript uh, went through the tandem launch system. What that means is that it uh, rather than have the specific inventors form a startup, they chose to work with us so that we could build a company for them. Uh, the inventor uh, out of Binghamton University, uh, Ronald Miles, was very excited to proliferate his work, but he was far more interested in continuing the scientific pursuit. And so uh, we essentially picked up his invention and, and, and spent uh, our investment developing a company called Soundscript out of it. So when Ronald Miles set out to uh, so Ronald Miles actually did not set out to build a directional microphone, which is what Soundscript does. He actually set out to study the biomechanics of the Ormia fly. What he'd observed was that um, the Ormia fly has this incredible ability to record very high fidelity audio using its uh, uh, using its uh, uh, essentially its ears or ears facsimile, if you will, uh, but uh, but could also determine direction. Uh, with a very small gap between its acoustic sensing apparatus. Now, this is relevant because uh, he knew that when we want to record anything with microphones, uh, we actually aren't able to record directionality with microphones that are very close together. There's a specific physics uh, that, that, that connects the, the gap between two microphones and our ability to differentiate an angle uh, of, of, of incidence of, of that sound. And uh, and so this was not just scientifically interesting studying how how insects hear, uh, but also had some relevance relevance industrially that he was familiar with. So the technical problem uh, that came out of that research was how to address poor signal to noise ratio and sound isolation inside microphones. And uh, if if we express it a bit further, it's that because we have this technical problem that. If we want to determine the direction where a sound comes from, we have to use larger gaps and often many more microphones. The 
consequence of that technical problem is that all our equipment, all our devices that required directional audio had to be much larger and much bulkier. Uh, Alexa, uh, the device that might sit in some of your homes, does not have to be as fat and large and ugly as she is. <laughs> but she is because those microphones have to be placed in very specific locations in order to get a directional recording of your voice when you're shouting at it. And so, uh, well, I say her, but ultimately she's, uh, <laughs> uh, Alexa is genderless. Uh, so, so ultimately this technical problem uh, resulted in a, in a, in a multi-year research endeavor from Ronald Miles out of Binghamton. And the result of this was what he called, uh, what he developed was essentially a velocity-based microphone. The scientific discovery that he had made, him and, him and other peers in this field, were that the hearing apparatus of insects do not respond to pressure. They respond to the collisions of air molecules against a very thin thread inside the, the a cavity within the insect. The result of this is that uh, ultimately the, the microphone or the fiber itself recorded the direction or the velocity that the sound was coming into rather than recording the amplitude like you would with a standard microphone. And so that was the technical problem and the discovery of how nature has solved that technical problem. If we move into the market problem, the market problem being that we want to be able to build directional microphones that we can fit into small devices so that we can make, for example, our iPhones much more effective at, at telecommunication, at conferencing, or at localizing where our voices are. The, the solution or the product or the, or the expression of the invention became the development of a MEMS, a new MEMS divine, design for a microphone that could localize sound with high signal to noise ratio in a very small compact package. The market pickup of this technology uh, is through OEMs, OEMs being original equipment manufacturers. These are companies like Apple, like Samsung that, that develop these devices by assembling components from many other companies. And so ultimately, Ron Miles, uh, would see the proliferation of his invention, but also receive, uh, well, he's received many accolades on that work. You can actually Google Ronald Miles and, and see uh, tons of articles on what's happened here. Uh, but he's also currently benefiting from the royalties, fees, and the uh, engagements for additional research uh, collaboration that are coming through these industrial pickups of this technology. As the component manufacturers for microphones start to pick up sound script technology, all of that feeds back towards Ronald Miles' lab. By the way, I'm, I'm jumping through a lot of topics today very quickly. So if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or something like that, and I'd be happy to stop. Uh, Suzanne, if you can help me there, because I can't see the chat bar on my side. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, so I guess to go back to the original point, how do we determine if our invention has uh, market value? The goal becomes taking your research, articulating what your technology problem is, and then connecting it to whatever market problems might be manifested by virtue of that technical problem. So one of the things that product managers like to do in order to brainstorm new products uh, based on R&D is something called an input-output market table. It's something I call an input-output market table, but ultimately it's this exact table. And, uh, and essentially what the exercise is here is first to understand that technologies uh, can be thought of as transformations that take a certain set of inputs and produce a certain set of outputs. And that those outputs can then be packaged into features that then solve market problems on the other side. And so the process starts by looking at the research problem that you're solving and then immediately dropping everything and essentially investigating the industry, identifying where that technical problem might be manifesting itself out in the world. When you do that, what you're gonna identify is that rather than do nothing. Many markets have found solutions to solving those technical problems, but perhaps not in the elegant way in which your invention has. They might put, for example, humans on the job to fill in the gap, or they might be making devices that solve the problem that can't ultimately be used in every context, but only in a context where this, uh, where they can hack together a solution. In Sanskrit case, that hacked, that hacked solution was the fact that directional microphones only really existed in the consumer world in these smart hubs or in these large microphone arrays and that industrially they existed in these very large microphone guns 
So what we did with Soundscript when we picked up the invention was first identify what the inputs to the technology were. We understood that what we had was essentially a fiber that could pick up sound velocity. And it could pick it up in one axis. So the first thing that we determined was that if we wanted to, for example, record audio in three dimensions, we would actually need a sensor in each axis, X, Y, and Z. What we then understood was that as each one of these fibers would move, it would generate a capacitive signal, which would, we could then relate to an acoustic signal. And so the outputs of that invention were an X-axis capacitance, a Y-axis capacitance, and a Z-axis capacitance. Now, that's where we had to stop, because in order to understand what we could do with our invention, we had to go out into the world. And this is where we identified what our invention could do in various products that those products seem to be inching towards trying to do, but can't because of the physical, because of the technical problem that this invention was addressing. So this is where the feature, this is where the feature side starts to come in. So we started looking at different markets where sound is used, where microphones are used. We identified the speech recognition market, entertainment, security for voice recognition, for example, industrial IoT for event monitoring. And then we worked backwards and we thought about what is it that those industries need? What market problems exist there that they're trying to solve? And this is where we identified that they wanted, they had interests in applications like sound event localization, video and audio zooming, uh, video audio zooming being the ability to connect with a certain person's voice in a group of people's voices. Person identification, this can get very difficult when there's multiple people talking at the same time. And intelligibility, intelligibility enhancement, which means just making your voice clearer in a multi, in a, in a sort of cocktail party problem where many people are speaking. So you'll notice we went from inputs to outputs where we looked at the technological solution to the technical problem we were solving. And then we stopped and we went to the market and we looked for market problems that were related to the field that we were investigating and worked backwards into applications. And this is where the two meet. They meet in features. Features are essentially how we can package what your invention does to do something towards the application that we've listed. So the features of the Soundscript technology were that it was directional, that we could identify sound location if we collected all three of the axes, that we could do things like denoising. And this was a, a side feature, but it could also work on very low power resource devices, which meant that we could enter things like mobile. So this isn't a um, sequential exercise. This isn't something where you work from, you know, uh, right to left in this case, and then work from left to right and meet in the middle and do this once. What tends to end up happening is that as you as you progress through your research, as you develop, as you identify the properties of your invention, if you will, while simultaneously looking for expressions of your technical problem out in the world, you'll find yourself bouncing back and forth between these two sides of the table, eventually building up these potential features that your technology could create should it be productized. Now, remember, we're not talking, we haven't thought at all about the path to making these things reliable or making these things uh, manufacturable. We are just thinking in the limit, if my invention could be extrapolated to a solution, what could it potentially do? So, like I mentioned before, one of the things you really need to do to get involved in this space is to get out, <laughs> is, to, is to leave the lab and start talking to people. Now, uh, before you start talking to specific people, there are some tools that we have in the trade uh, that can help you connect to the right resources. So, and this again, again, is not really just for people who are interested in commercializing their work. If you're interested in deepening uh, the, the value of your research problems, then you really do need to talk to the world to get out there and identify what are the deep technological challenges that people are facing. And so uh, it's very difficult to come up with research problems in a vacuum, I think is the general message here. And so um, you can greatly benefit from regular conversations. Uh, and I do, I, do, I, I do recommend that you start developing relationships with representatives at not just uh, companies of interest and relevance to your work, but also investors, uh, because this really interesting thing happens where they will start coming to you for your advice on various matters. And, and that, that can ultimately act, create a, a, a positive feedback loop for it, which ends up expanding your network as you get connected to more and more people and more and more companies. Um, it also has this ability to 
I find mature your work. Um, there are there are many, let's say, publications. Uh, you you can look through IEEE, for example, in certain research areas that one would think, what is exactly the relevance of that work? The relevance of that work these days. Uh, papers that might feel iterative, that might feel like they have uh, diminishing research value over time. And what's happening there isn't that that research uh, isn't or wasn't interesting at some time. It's that those researchers are so out of touch with how the world has moved around them that they're still investigating spaces that have long since been either uh, let go or put to rest or or become rather stagnant. Uh, so so uh, ultimately, tracking the way the industry has moved around your work is a way to remain relevant. Uh, and finally, it's also a way to surface money, which is, of course, uh, great to accelerate your research. So I've, I've listed two tools over here, websites that you can use to start the process of, of connecting with people. The first is LinkedIn. This is an obvious one. Uh, you can use LinkedIn to great effect uh, for connecting with relevant parties at different companies. So let's say you've uh, let's say you've identified the industry that you're interested in. You've identified, let's say, the top three companies operating in that space. And the next question is, who should I talk to at these companies and how do I find them? Uh, this is a situation I end up in very often uh, because we're often looking for customers for our companies. And so the first thing we need to do is actually do this kind of search. And so LinkedIn can be very powerful for this because you can actually find the employees that work at a company and virtually all the companies at, a, at the size that you're going to want to engage them at, the ones that are large enough that they have um, an R&D division, that they have an R&D culture as well as a product culture, are going to have an innovation office of their own or at least some form of corporate development office whose job it is is to keep a tab on research happening at universities, startups, and the like, in order to keep that company uh, ahead of the game and relevant. And so what you can do on LinkedIn is ultimately search for people that work at a company and identify those that are working in their innovation offices. And you can do this with a simple search uh, using the LinkedIn website. The second place you might want to look is Crunchbase. Uh, that's crunchbase.com. Uh, this is a place that lists really uh, similarly lists uh, people that can work at those companies. It can also, in the tab that you'll see at the far right, list uh, news items and signals around the kinds of technology that they're developing. And they also have interesting technology summaries there that can help you also put that company in context when it comes to your research. Crunchbase is especially valuable if you're looking for investors. Uh, virtually all investors worth talking to will list on Crunchbase. And you can use Crunchbase to search for investors based on their technology focus, the scale of company that they invest in, uh, the type of tech, uh, the type of products they invest in. And so uh, I find myself using this constantly uh, when our companies are financing. Okay, uh, so how to protect your work, uh, how to think about your work when when you feel like you might have something that's commercially viable. So. I, I can't stress this enough, um, and I, I guess it's somewhat unfortunate, but researchers are the first people uh, that have to be proactive in, in, in thinking about their work commercially. And the reason for this is because of patent law. Uh, there are many different ways to protect different kinds of work. Uh, copyright will protect uh, authored documents and software code. Uh, trade secrets will protect formulas that you don't want to share with the world. But Patents are, in the vast majority of cases, the IP form that are used to protect research, um, utility patents specifically. And patent law forbids the public disclosure of the contents of an invention before you patent. Um, there, are, there are some exemptions to this, some grace periods in certain countries, but largely speaking, you massively diminish the value of your intellectual property if you publish your work before it is patented. And so this is where being in close contact with your TTO is essential because the, the inevitable product of your research is going to be a publication. Uh, the inevitable activities of your research group are going to be uh, yourself, students, other researchers, going to conferences and talking about your research. All of these things, uh, the, the eventual uh, path of, of, of your PhD is going to be presenting your thesis to a council. All three of those events are considered public disclosures of your research. And so proactivity is essential to maintain the commercial value of your work. And, and this is why calling your TTO, keeping them updated, 
sending in your technology disclosure early as early as possible uh, can really can really help you uh, explore the commercial opportunities for your work without holding up your academic trajectory. The other thing is that it's not always clear when you are sitting on something interesting. And while uh, it can be very difficult for someone who's got a full time job as a researcher to keep their tabs on the industry, like I just described, your TTO is doing this on a regular basis. And so uh, going to your TTO with what you have and and tapping their opinions and their expertise on this uh, can often do the job of what I just described in terms of identifying whether or not there are market problems that connect with the technical problems that uh, that you're solving. So. I'm going to this somehow came out in the wrong order, but I wanted to, before we wrapped up, uh, touch a little bit on what to expect should you engage. Um, now, I want you to ignore virtually every column here. I pulled this from a different webinar uh, based on licensing, uh, and I'd be very happy to, to talk to any of you about licensing. Should you be uh, considering it or engaging in that process right now with your tech transfer office? Uh, but I wanted to just sort of give you a bird's eye view of the kind of things that people have to consider when they're talking about your invention. Um, licensing an invention is, uh, is a very complex process. It's ultimately embodied in what's called a license agreement. When, you talk, when you're thinking about putting your invention into, into another company or into a startup, the first thing you wanna think about is how you're going to give the rights to your invention to that other entity. And a TTO has to consider every single one of the factors on this slide uh, while they negotiate for this license externally. And this, I, I think the, the main motivation for me to show this is that often we might be incentivized or we might think that um, we can pursue this on our own. Uh, there are universities out there, uh, progressive ones that have what's called an inventor owned policy. So in, in most universities, uh, most, most research labs ultimately have their inventions owned by the university and then uh, through their employment agreement, they have a deal with the university that splits any kind of potential commercial revenue from your invention across the university and across you, across the inventors. Uh, in some universities, this is not true. In some universities, you actually own the rights to the inventions you develop at a university. In that context, or in, or in similar contexts, you might be you might be incentivized to try and pursue this yourself. And the reason why I recommend highly against it, and why I recommend working with your technology transfer office is because there are far too many variables when it comes to how your work can be commercialized, how your rights can be split across countries, across territories, across product lines, um, different kinds of exclusivity, non-exclusivity, being able to retain your own right to carry out your research should your technology be commercialized. All of these things are, play a role in the commercialization of your work and, and that is, and, and and this is about 200 reasons in front of you right now why a technology transfer office is your friend. They are on your side in this. They're going to be extremely motivated to protect how your work proliferates, not just for your sake, uh, but because they are gonna have a very hard time attracting top tier talent to the university if they can't find a way to protect the output of that talent. Uh, and they're also going to have a really hard time protecting their university reputation if they end up signing deals that result in massive losses in, for example, intellectual property or the ability to do research. So there isn't just um, there isn't just a motivation from a from a positioning point of view for a TTO to protect you, but it's also largely structurally motivated by the entire university. And so, wrapping up. Um, I, I spoke a lot about many different things and, and this, this webinar did have the hazard that it might actually touch on too many points at once, but I just wanted to give you a big overview of what tech transfer offices do. But ultimately, the big takeaways here are that tech transfer officers are really the front lines, the, the shepherds of university innovation. Um, and, and they have a very difficult job. Uh, researchers are supported by these TTOs at every level of engagement. Um, be wary, not wary, but but mind the often perceptually conflicting motivations of different parts of your university. Uh, understand that um, there is a form of comfort in being within your research, within the confines of your research lab, because and and your research department, because in that space, everyone's motivated to do the same thing: to further scientific knowledge and to publish it. 
But as soon as you start expanding your scope out of that into the world, into the rest of the university, you start to see a whole host of conflicting motivations or tensions that mean that it's good to have somebody on your side. And finally, even if you couldn't care less about commercializing your work, there is value in engaging the industry around you for your academic career. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Pardon me. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Omar. I think they don't have permissions to, to participate. Uh, I don't know if Tom, can you help us with the permissions? Like, how can we set up for them to raise their hands or ask a question? Uh, well, well, Thomas, do that. Um, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned about industry grants. Uh, are there any um, like specific funding sources or grants resources available there that specialize in, in this research and in-depth technology innovation and transfer? Can you mention some of them? Uh, are resources specifically for grants? Yeah. So, um, what you'll typically, so, okay, uh, so there's a few different layers here. Uh, the 1st thing I would do if, um, so, I guess we're gonna have to do this in a matrix way. So, uh, let's say you're a researcher that wants to just license wants to get additional research uh, grant money into your into your university lab. Um, and that's all you want to do. Uh, and I'm assuming that you're also a researcher who knows um, all the grant uh, agencies that provide grants specifically for fundamental research uh, in your country. And these are tend to be national grants. So you probably have a, a national research organization that provides you with grants. Um, if you want to up on that, then what I would recommend you do is look at local industries uh, around. You. Starting local always uh, works best because uh, people like to invest if you will uh, close to home. and so if there are any companies in your in your in your country that have industries aligned with what you're doing then i would recommend looking at their innovation offices or getting in touch with them to identify if they have any calls for proposals or any interested uh in any any overlapping research endeavors that they would be willing to fund your university to pursue um if on the other hand you're interested in commercializing your work if you are for example going to build a startup uh, there is another category of grants that opens up for you, and these are often grants that come from uh, national research organizations or, or, or economic organizations that are there to support local entrepreneurship. Uh, in, for example, uh, Canada, we have something called the I 2 I grant. This is something that pays professors to support their development of commercial prototypes of their invention. Uh, in the US, they have what's called the SBIR. Uh, this is a massive amount of financing. Uh, to help you spin out a business and commercialize your research. Um, they often come with different terms and different configuration requirements. Uh, but so, but I think largely speaking, what I would say is that look nationally for uh, grants that might support your research directly or support the development of a startup. And then really don't stop nationally if you're looking at uh, grants to support uh, industry academic collaboration grants. There are many multinational businesses uh, Samsung being one, uh, you can you can go to Samsung Research, uh, the Samsung Research website. They have a call for proposals basically every year that you could that you could apply to and get some funding from. Thank you. Do, does anyone from the audience have a, any question? If not, maybe I can ask you another question, Omar. I don't know if it is anyone else. Yes. Um, what can we do? Like, we know that in some of our countries, um, like we are in region nine, Latin America, and, and probably we don't have that much resources as the SBIR for, for, for this kind of work. Like, what, what the, like, policymakers or other, like, you know, the ones that are decision takers, or the ones that make decisions in, in our country, or those that are player or key players in, in our ecosystem can, what role can they play in, in promoting this? Like, uh, because we, we do have, I am sure that in every country we have researchers, but maybe there is something missing to, you know, to motivate them to do that. So what are, what have you seen in other countries that started like this, but are seeing more success cases because something happened, any policy or, or, you know, a decision make at the at a high level in, in the in the country. What are your thoughts about that? 
Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I have virtually zero experience discussing policy. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> so uh, please take it with, with, with heaps of salt. Um, so if, if you look at the trajectory of innovation in somewhere like California um, and the development of the VC industry and a lot of the government support that the U.S. enjoys now for that industry, it didn't start like that. It actually started bottom up. So uh, Stanford had the foresight to very actively engage the industry community around it. Uh, they would open up lab spaces for those companies. Uh, they would essentially create a spatial environment where people from both sides could mingle. And um, much like, for example, the history of Bell Labs, where something very similar happened between uh, Bell and their research division and the mingling of, of product people with research people, when you put these different people together, they start to stimulate ideas together. And that creates a pressure. You get entrepreneurial students trying to build things. You get professors wanting to uh, work and, and collaborate with the industry. And that pressure starts to eventually generate innovation that the government takes notice of. And, and that's what, what at least historically for a place like California uh, pushed them to eventually release massive legislation on the ability for universities to commercialize IP that they generated. Before then, because they were any IP that was publicly funded was technically owned by the government and couldn't be used anywhere uh, without government permission. So it was, it was very burdensome. Uh, so on the government side, I, I really would not be the first person to ask about this, but ultimately how this has transformed to other countries is um, the ability to get certain kinds of employment subsidized. So for example, in Canada, we have what's called the science research and uh, economic development credit. This is a uh, this is a tax credit that can return to companies uh, a percentage of the salaries of technical workers working on R and D projects. For example, that's one way that innovation is is somewhat subsidized in both startups as well as large companies. Um, there's, uh, for example, well, universities uh, have used the local investment ecosystem to develop small funds that can be used to deploy ten, twenty thousand uh, dollars to a researcher with the goal of getting them to some kind of commercial product that they could then present to a customer. Uh, so this is, these, are, these are sort of, well, I would say apart from things like tax credits and such, there are grassroots methods that universities ultimately, I think, can take, uh, technology innovation offices can do in order to push this frontier forward. Thank you, Omar. It's very interesting. Like, I, I don't know also a policy or maker, but for example, I can talk about our experience in Panama. I don't know if there are any uh, attendees from uh, from the group that are from Panama, but we have an organization uh, called uh, it's uh, the National Secretary of Science and Technology, is Senacid, and they uh, are putting a lot of funds to promote innovation, entrepreneurship, and, and development of, of, let's say, uh, innovative solutions to solve problems. And with my experience that I've seen in when I was studying in, in, in California, uh, for example, you mentioned Stanford. So here, there, sorry, the academia is promoting, you know, the innovation in some way, like they are doing the research, they're pushing the industry to be in their own pace. But in our countries, um, I can say Panama, um, the industry is leading more, you know, innovation than academia in, in most cases. So, so thinking out loud. I don't know if, if there is a way that, I don't know if there are any participants from Panama, a way to bring the companies to the universities to have like, you know, that kind of projects to promote research about their, their problems. And that's something that Senacid is doing. They are creating funds to partner companies with these large uh, or, or startups or, or small entrepreneurs or, or innovators or, you know, I, people with ideas to partner with large corporations like uh, airlines, for example, Copa Airlines and Constanza has, uh, has experienced us in this, how to solve the problems of big corporations like design partners. And, and in some way, that's like a strategy to promote the, 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 the transfer of the, of the, of the, the technology from researchers from university or, or small entrepreneurs to, to be corporations to, to go to the market. So it's just something to think about, and, and I hope that we ha continue to have this conversation and see how we can get more of these key players involved in all this what we are doing, and 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 have and see some impact in that. I don't know if, if someone wants. I think to that's very that. interesting. Um, so yeah, it's interesting that in some places you might see a public pressure or at least an academic pressure towards innovation, and in others you'll see a private pull from the industry to get this out. Um, 
in places where the private industry, or at least where the industrial sector is leading the innovation charge. I, I think that the university innovation office and universities themselves are best positioned to take advantage of and to amplify that effect. Uh, we look at what companies need, right? Startups need, for example, lab space. They need places where they can, you know, experiment on new battery technologies or on their products. Often, uh, the capital expenditure required to get all their equipment is going to be a little bit far out. These are opportunities for universities to provide that space, and and. I guess people can get stuck there, right? They they think, well, what what can we do in order to get compensated for that space, or how what how do we make use of that relationship, at least on the university side? And that's where I think that often we think too quickly about money, or we think too quickly about the money now, or we we take these very basic approaches to renting lab space or what have you. But um, if we can think into the future, then. It's interesting to consider the idea that, for, for example, these companies, uh, these universities, or at least these labs might get equity in those companies, uh, might get research partnerships, or perhaps rather than charging them rent, uh, they, it's, a, it's a quid pro quo based on developing a research grant with them or sending a student over to do work over there. And so, um, and so, yeah, you're right. This is a, this is a field that's just full of so many different potential ideas. And I guess you're right to bring up. Uh, the specific case of Latin America, for example, in that I don't know that any country or region has succeeded in building their own innovation sector by copying the innovation strategy of another country. Uh, these are extremely unique uh, forces coming together within a certain context in a certain time for a certain country. And so uh, I think that each country is going to have its own journey to that outcome. Yeah. Thank you very much, Omar, and, and we hope that we, we keep this conversation and, and, and see more participation from the artists. And I, I'm pretty sure that you have lots of things to share, and, and this is part of what we're looking for, exchange of ideas, because there are different countries represented in, in, this, in, this, in these webinars. So thank you, Omar. Uh, it's already time. I, I want to, to close this uh, second webinar, thanking you again for, for your for your presentation.